Hi, everybody. My name is Damon Cortese. I am a developer advocate on the EMR team here at AWS. And today I want to talk to you about a move to managed analytics. So I used to be a big data architect on the EMR team. So I helped our customers uh, design, build, prototype, test, and debug, at the end of the day, different big data solutions on top of EMR. And before that, I actually had my own startup here in Seattle that was doing social analytics. And I ran both an HBase cluster and an Elasticsearch cluster. So really excited to talk about this topic today. So let's, let's dig in. So I want to talk about why you might want to make the move to managed AWS analytics services. And then I want to dig in on a few different services as well. So I want to talk about real-time analytics services, for example, managed streaming for Kafka and Kinesis Data Analytics. I want to talk about big data analytics services as well, so EMR. <clears throat> and then I also want to talk about operational services like Elasticsearch. So we'll dive into each of those, see why you, want to why you might want to make the move, what the benefits are, and we'll do a little demo as well. So let's zoom out a little bit. There's realities that customers are facing today. There is an explosion of data. This is nothing new, right? This has been happening for the past decade, ever since I started tweeting 100 times a day, right? There is just way much more information than we can even handle. And it's not just you know text-based data. There's video data. There's IoT data. There's weather data. There's all sorts of data that's coming in from all over the place. And there's also an explosion of personas. And so what's happening is we have all this data and we have more and more people wanting to use the data as well. It's not just an analyst that's making a BI dashboard once a month anymore, right? It could be the salesperson that wants to get the most up-to-date sales numbers. It could be a marketing person that's running a real-time social campaign and needs those numbers to help gauge the interest of the, the social campaign. It could be an engineer building a new feature for our products, or it could be a, a DevOps person that's doing some log analytics uh, either in the past week or maybe the past year or what have you. So there's just more and more people that are accessing this data as well. And then finally, there's a demand for faster decision-making based on that real-time data. I like to joke a little bit that it's not really the real-time data that people want. It's the just-in-time data, right? When you log in at 8 in the morning, you want to know that your data arrived at 7.59 a.m. But I digress. There's definitely a demand for faster decision-making based on that data so people can use that to make their businesses more successful. So along that line, customers want more value from their data too. Like I said, the amount of data is growing exponentially and also from a lot, um, a lot of new sources. So when I had my startup, we had about 100 people and we also had about 100 different SaaS tools. So that means a SaaS tool for every single person. If you work in a medium or large sized organization, you're probably aware that there is a proliferation of new data sources, right? If you're a data engineer or a data scientist, you probably have an email in your inbox that says, hey, Damon, um, maybe not Damon, but hey, can I have a real quick data dump from that other new source that I just signed up for the other day? This isn't anything new, right? So there's more sources uh, and they're getting more diverse too. Like I said, the, the type of data is changing and it's just used by so many more people now. So people are taking that data, they want more value from it, and they're building different applications too. Like I said, it might be a BI dashboard. It might be a product um, that's being built right into your own SaaS product. It might just be log analytics. There's all sorts of different applications. So with the increasing data volumes, with the desire to get the right data to the right people, we need to be prepared to deal with that. So one thing I do want to call out is the lake house architecture on AWS. And this really isn't anything new, right? This is just kind of acknowledging the realities of how we use data today. So in the middle, you've got your data lake, right? There, uh, people have been building data lakes on S3 for quite some time now. There are customers that have exabytes of data in S3. But what we've seen is that the data flows both in and out and around the data lake, right? So you've got your data lake. It's fully scalable. But what happens is you might need to pull that data out for different uh, use case specific purposes. And this is nothing new. When I've consulted with customers, I've told them, hey, if you, you know, have a data warehouse for your marketing team and for your sales team, that's perfectly normal, right? And in some cases, it's actually preferred because those teams, while they may work with some common data models, they probably have their own data models as well. So that's what happens. People pull their data into Redshift put it back in the data lake. Or if you're doing machine learning, you might pull data from the data lake into SageMaker run some training on it, and then it might put it back into a relational database that people, people in your product can then use uh, to you know, make the product better. Or if you're doing big data processing, you might pull that into EMR, run some Spark jobs, run some Presto jobs, or log analytics, you might pull that out into something like Elasticsearch and feed it back into different parts of the system, right? So data is flowing all over the place. And a great way to deal with that is with these purpose-built data services. So whether it's Redshift for data warehousing, 
EMR for big data processing. There's lots of use case specific data services that can help make your life easier. The other thing to call out here is the seamless data movement. People want the right data at the right time, but they also want that to go to the right people. So there's a layer of governance that has to happen here as well. And so AWS Lake Formation helps you manage the security and the governance of all that data, regardless of where it is. And finally, we want that to be performant and cost effective too. So we're always heavily investing and um, improving the performance of these different engines and making it uh, as cheap as possible for you to be able to do this. So that's the Lakehouse architecture on AWS. And one thing I do wanna call out here is the rate of innovation that's happening with all these different services. So this slide here actually shows a number of different releases that we had in the analytics space at reInvent this past December. So on the top, we've got some purpose-built data services, right? EMR, we've been making some improvements there. You can now run EM EMR on your Kubernetes cluster with EMR on Amazon e EKS. We've got EMR Studio, which is a new notebook first integrated development experience. And then there's other changes there too, right? Like on Redshift, um, we've got Redshift data sharing and Redshift ML. You can now create a machine learning model inside of Redshift just by using a create model SQL command, which is pretty awesome, right? On the seamless data movement side, Glue has made a lot of advancements there too as well this year. A couple I'll call out, one is Glue Data Brew. So that helps you cleanse and prep data as it's coming out of different environments inside the Glue environment. And then Glue Elastic Views helps you keep that data in sync across many different services using materialized views. And it does that for you automatically. So it makes it really easy to do that. On the governance side, of course, I mentioned lake formation. So there's transactions that we've added there, row level security, as well as acceleration that helps ensure that your data is in the most optimal format uh, to be queried by these different analytic services. And of course, we're always investing in performance, right? On the EMR side, we have performance improvements on Hive, Presto, and Spark. We invest heavily in those runtimes to make sure they run as best as possible in AWS. And Redshift, of course, has automated performance tuning. We do uh, machine learning on your query logs in order to tune the cluster for the best performance possible. And there's also the um, Advanced Query Accelerator, the Aqua engine for Redshift, that helps accelerate your queries automatically for you. So this is just, you know, since December that this was all launched, right? So we're continuously innovating in this space to make it easier and better for you to work with the analytics so you can do the job that you want to. Now, let's say you have your own uh, on-prem analytics service. If you do, you are fully aware that self-managing analytics services is time-consuming, complex, and expensive. It's really, really hard. Like I mentioned, I had an HBase cluster at my own startup that we managed, and it wasn't a very big one. I think it was maybe 10 terabytes or something like that. And there was one time that you know we were getting up close to capacity, and so we needed to increase the capacity of our HBase cluster. So I got on the phone. This was a while ago. I got on the phone and called our data center, and I said, hey, um, we need to order some more servers in order to get more capacity for our HBase cluster. And they said, yeah, sure, okay, that'll be six months. Si excuse me? Well, there was a hard drive shortage, and they couldn't buy more servers because they couldn't buy more disks to put in the servers. So, you know, just managing those types of complexities is not really something that I, as a developer, really wanted to be dealing with. Um, and so you need dedicated folks to manage these on-prem or even, you know, self-managed analytic services. And it's really, really challenging, right? You have to deal with the hardware and the software installation, you have to deal with upgrades, you have to deal with capacity planning, and not only the technical aspect of capacity planning, but also the financial aspect, right? When I called to buy those servers, that was a three-year investment that I had to make to order those servers and keep them running for, for the next three years, right? So there's a lot to manage there. And that doesn't even touch on the performance and the throughput and the optimization of the, those analytics services themselves, right? That's a whole nother layer of folks that you need to hire and train and, and keep around to make sure that that service is running as, as optimal as possible. So this is hard, right? And I think folks would rather spend time building their own applications rather than managing these analytic services. I didn't even touch on security and compliance, but if you've ever been through you know, a compliance review for all the different uh, compliances out there, it can be really challenging there too. So that's probably the easiest way I can introduce that um, the move to managed AWS analytics services, right? There are a few different ways that I want to talk about that today. So one, customers want to move their on-premise Hadoop and Spark workloads into the cloud. They want to move that to Amazon EMR, where they can run Spark, Hive, Presto, Flink, HBase. EMR is a way to deploy big data frameworks on AWS at the click of a button. If you're running your Elk stack, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, 
customers want to move that to managed Amazon Elasticsearch service, right? Again, at the click of a button, you can create a new Elasticsearch cluster. We manage the upgrades for you and the backups and all that kind of stuff. On the streaming side, folks that run Kafka, Kafka can be a pretty complex system as well. We can move that to Amazon Managed Streaming for Kafka for your real-time analytics. And then if you have Flink, which is a popular data processing framework, you can use Kinesis Data Analytics for Flink to consume the data from Kafka and process it. So these are the services that we'll talk about today. Let me dive in first on the streaming side. So Amazon MSK is a fully managed, highly available and secure Apache Kafka service. It's fully compatible with open source Kafka so you can migrate and run your existing Kafka applications on AWS without changes. And we've had customers do proof of concepts in this in weeks, if not days, in terms of moving Kafka from on-prem to the cloud, right? It's fully managed as well. This means that we manage the provisioning, configuration, and maintenance of those Kafka clusters, which is fantastic, right? And it's highly available. So you can rely on the experience that AWS has to ensure that those clusters are running across availability zones and that there's continuous cluster health monitoring too. On the security side, there's network isolation, authorization, and access control that's built into the service. So you can rely on AWS to manage that for you while you work on your application. So that's something that's really nice about the Amazon MSK service is it helps provide all of this for you, right? And so it's really, really beneficial if you want to run Kafka in the cloud. The way that you might want to make this move to manage real-time analytics is you can migrate your on-prem or self-managed Kafka to M the managed service pretty uh, pretty easily. That's one of the nice things about Kafka. Uh, there's an open source project called Mirror Maker, and you connect that to your existing Kafka cluster, and you can replicate that cluster into Amazon MSK and begin migrating your applications as time and resources allow. So pretty straightforward to be able to do that. That's one of the great benefits of Kafka, clearly, is that you can replicate that data really, really easily. So that's one way that folks have been able to move their Kafka clusters from on-prem to MSK in a really, really easy fashion, right? And so one of the one of the big benefits there for sure. You can also monitor uh, MSK in CloudWatch. There is Prometheus plugin, so if you're already using Prometheus, you can use that to manage MSK as well. So again, just a really easy way to move that into, into the cloud. I wanna talk a little bit about all the different benefits that this provides, right? So on the left-hand side, if you're running an on-prem Kafka cluster, those are the set of concerns that you need to worry about, and it goes all the way down to the power and network, right? And so you got to make sure that there's power to the racks. You got to make sure that the switches are configured in the right way. Then you have to get the hardware. You have to know, you know, that that hardware is installed, that you've got the operating system on there, that you've got the operating system patched. We haven't even gotten to Kafka yet, right? So that is uh, just the base level of concerns if you're managing that on-prem and then you get to Kafka and then there's all sorts of things there. So you can, of course, uh, use another service. You don't have to do this in your own data center. You could use Amazon EC2 and run Kafka on there. And so Amazon will take care of you know, the power and the network and the hardware and the OS and all that stuff. But then you still have to worry about you know, patching and running that cluster and upgrading it and all that kind of stuff. And upgrades are something that can be pretty tricky as well. I've got another fun story there. Uh, there was one time that we decided to upgrade our HBase cluster. And it was a pretty major upgrade. Um, but we did it in staging, worked perfectly fine. Then we went to production, we rolled out this upgrade in production, and all of a sudden our data pipeline slowed to a halt. Um, and we didn't know what was going on. Luckily, we had a, a uh, support contract with a vendor, so we called them in, and I literally had uh, HBase and HDFS committers you know, remoted into my laptop, connected into our cluster, debugging this for an entire week. Our cluster was down, our business was down, for an entire week while these folks came in and tried to help us debug and figure out what went wrong just by upgrading the version. It turned out the servers that we had installed were configured with RAID. That's it, that's all it was. Instead of RAID, we should have used JBOD, which is just a bunch of disks. And for some reason, that version upgrade exposed that misconfiguration. And even when the HBase folks came in, they just kind of assumed that we had JBOD because that was the common configuration. And so even something simple like that, even something like a simple version upgrade can cost your business an entire week, right? So if you can rely on somebody else to do that, you, I would much prefer that personally. So with Amazon MSK, we take care of almost every single piece of that stack on the right-hand side, right? We manage the provisioning and the infrastructure. We take care of the version upgrades, take care of patching and high availability and security, all really, really hard problems. So at the end of the day, you can worry about your application development and optimization of the cluster. 
Once you've got MSK in place, you can also move to managed real-time analytics. So if you use Apache Flink, you can run Apache Flink on Amazon Kinesis Data Analytics. Again, this is a managed service. You can spin it up really quickly, upload your Flink code, and you're pretty much good to go. It can connect into Amazon MSK, but it can also connect into Kinesis Data Streams and Kinesis Data Firehose and additional streaming sources. You can, of course, run Flink on EMR if you want to, but if you would rather not worry about the operational aspects of it, just take a look at Kinesis Data Analytics for Flink. Makes it a lot easier for you. So let's move on. Amazon Elasticsearch, fully managed service that makes it easy to deploy, manage, and scale Elasticsearch for the most demanding log analytics workloads. It's fully managed. I deployed a domain this morning. It was really easy. I just went in, clicked next a few times, and I instantly had an Elasticsearch cluster, right? It takes care of version upgrades. It takes care of backups, and it's secure and compliant. So all this stuff you get uh, when you're spinning it up on a managed service. So I can worry about building my Elasticsearch service and not worry about uh, building a custom you know, routing layer for my Elasticsearch cluster so I can have my multi-tenant customers on the exact right host. And that's something that we did at my startup. We built a custom routing layer for Elasticsearch in order to uh, make it easier to run. Should we have done that? Probably not, right? I would much rather have focused on building the social analytics software and not Elasticsearch routing software. So that's one of the things that's really nice about Elasticsearch. In addition to that, with AWS, you get additional benefits too. So one of the things that we came out with last year was ultra warm for Elasticsearch. So this is a warm storage tier for Amazon ES. If you've ever run Elasticsearch, you know, A, it's pretty expensive to run. B, it requires a lot of tuning, and C, if you want to keep a lot of data in it, it's going to be really, really expensive. And so what Ultra Warm is, is it's a warm storage tier for Elasticsearch. So let's imagine you have 14 days of hot data in Elasticsearch. If we take that down to seven days, with the remaining seven days that you would have left, you can store 59 days in the Ultra Warm storage tier. So now you have 66 days of data for the same price that you would have had 14 days. And you can access it through the same Elasticsearch and Kibana APIs that you're used to. And you can go all the way up to three petabytes per domain as well. So this is pretty amazing if you have a you know log analytics uh, service in Elasticsearch, which is pretty common, right? In most cases, you uh, are only accessing maybe the past week or the past month of hot data in Elasticsearch, but you do occasionally need to go back in time maybe three months, maybe a year or something like that. But that's a pretty rare occurrence. But imagine if you could do that using the same APIs at a lower cost. It's a pretty, you know, pretty amazing innovation there to be able to add that service to Elasticsearch so you can have that additional data at a lower cost. Finally, Amazon EMR. So EMR is a way to run big data frameworks in the cloud, again, at the click of a button on a managed service. You can run Spark, Hive, Presto, HBase, Flink, and about 20 different open source frameworks. We keep up to date with the latest open source frameworks by about 30 days. So if there's a new version of Spark, that'll come out pretty quickly on EMR as well. The big thing about EMR is the ability to separate storage and compute, right? So if you have your data stored in S3, you can use EMR to spin up one cluster with 10 nodes, 10 clusters with 100 nodes, whatever you want to process that data and then shut those clusters back down, which is really beneficial, right? You can make the most efficient use possible of your instances, of your resources. Now, folks might be used to this with Spark and Hive and Presto, and I'll go back to HBase again. But one of the things we've done with HBase is you can run HBase on top of S3 as well. So your HBase files will be stored in S3. You can start up an HBase cluster, run it for as long as you want to, spin it back down, and all those files get saved on, a, on, on S3. This is fantastic, right? If you've ever run an HBase cluster in the past, you know it was really expensive to keep all that data around on HBase because you had to have spinning disks supporting all the storage there, even if you weren't using the data. But now you can leave that on S3. So you can spin up um, one HBase cluster. You can also spin up one HBase primary cluster that writes data to S3, and then you can spin up additional other read-only clusters. So if you wanted to you know, shard out your data that way and have read-only clusters, you could do that too. And with HBase on S3 being um, you know, fully consistent, it's a fantastic way to run those, uh, one, run those workloads on, on S3. We just added some persistent H file tracking to HBase as well in the past, I believe it was the uh, past couple of months, that makes your write workloads run even better on HBase on S3. So again, constantly innovating, making it easier for you to do your job. 
The other thing I mentioned too is there's more performance, right? So we have Spark workloads that run 2.4 times faster in EMR compared to open source because of the improvements we've made in the runtime, right? So we've invested there in Spark, we've invested in Hive, we've invested in Presto, and we continue to invest in a lot of the other different engines as well. So that's where Amazon EMR is really great for being able to spin up these workloads, spin them back down, and uh, just make it really easy for you to be able to run your data. One of the other nice things that we introduced with EMR is EMR Studio. So this is a notebook first IDE experience where you can spin up a notebook without even needing access to the AWS console. It uses uh, AWS SSO, run your workloads in EMR or EMR and EKS or wherever you can connect to from that notebook and then you know spin it back down and share that notebook and commit it to Git. So what I wanna do, I wanna do a quick demo of Amazon EMR Studio to show you how that works. And uh, let's flip over to that demo right now. So this is the default landing page when you create an EMR Studio. And like I mentioned, Studio, when you authenticate to it, you don't need an AWS console account. You authenticate through AWS SSO. So I've got a basic username and password that I've created there. You could of course connect it to Active Directory or another third party identity provider if you wanted to but I've logged in with that username and password and I can go ahead and create a workspace right here. So when I do that, I just enter the workspace name. I could just say Damon workspace. I could add a description if I wanted to, and then the subnet. This is important just to make sure you're connecting to a subnet that has EMR clusters in it or that you can create EMR clusters in. In the advanced configuration, you can also connect to an existing EMR cluster if you want to. You can create a brand new one, and this is just a simple interface to create a new cluster. And you can select the number of instances and the instance size if you want to. And the other thing you can do is you can use a cluster template. So this this is really useful if you have an admin or somebody that's pre-configured a cluster. In this case, I've created a matplotlib cluster that has different operating system um, requirements installed on that cluster in order to draw some maps with matplotlib. So I'm going to go ahead and create that workspace. So you can see here, I've got my to court workspace that should pop up in just a second here um, is already attached to a cluster. So when I hop into that workspace, what you can see is I have a to court workbook <clears throat> and then I can create other notebooks for PySpark or Python 3 or what have you. So let me just go ahead and open that up. Uh, I am attached to a Python 3 kernel already. So I could just go ahead and say print hello and run my Python code like I want to. But one of the other nice things about EMR Studio is you can connect it to a Git repository. So I've got a Decort demo code Git repository here. And in there, I've got a Jupyter notebook that calculates the weather for a given day using um, some uh, ERA5 ZAR data on the registry of open data. So let me go back to Jupyter and I will connect that to a new Git repository. So I'll go ahead, enter the repository name here the repository URL and the branch for it. If I wanted to, I could authenticate to that repository using a uh, personal access token, but I'm just gonna connect to that Git repository um, publicly. So let me go ahead, click add repository. That'll go ahead and create a new repository for you. So that um, adds it into EMR, uh, authenticates with it if you wanted it to. And now I can click there and I can select my demo code repository and that links it with this EMR workspace. And what that's doing is it's just going, making a Git clone of that repository, pulling it into the workspace and populating all the data there. So that takes just a few seconds to go ahead and clone that repository. And once it's linked, I should be able to go into my file browser and look at that repository. So that should just take a second or two. Let me go into my file browser. There we go. So now I've got my demo code folder here and I can go in there, navigate to EMR Studio. And here is my weather day notebook. And I can go ahead, I can open that up. And this is a notebook that I've created before. I'm actually gonna go ahead and just uh, clear all the output so we can see it a little bit easier. So one thing you can do in a notebook is you can install dependencies if you want. So I already have matplotlib on this cluster, but if I didn't have these other dependencies, it would go ahead and install them. So if I just go ahead 
and hit enter here. Uh, you can see all those dependencies are already installed in the cluster, so I don't have to worry about that. And then I can take a look at my data. So this ERA5 data, this is uh, weather data that is uh, publicly available via the AWS registry of open data, which is pretty cool. It gives you weather data all the way back to 1979, I think. So for example, we can pull in precipitation amount for these latitude and longitudes. Uh, I can see I get precipitation amount on one hour basis. So a lot of data there that I can do. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a weather map for a given day. So I'll specify my date here. We'll say uh, 2021. Let's do 0213. There was actually a big snowstorm in Seattle that day. So I want to see what the weather looks like for that day. One thing I can do here is this cell has a parameter tag. So if I click on the wrench icon and under advanced tools, you can see there's a tag section and it's labeled parameters. This means that I can override this uh, specific cell with an external parameter. And I'll show how we can run an EMR notebook execution that runs this notebook with different parameters. So I'll close that back up. We've got a few other just helper functions here. I'm going to go ahead and execute. And these functions here read that czar data from S3 and return it back to the notebook. So if I hit enter to run, uh, pull in some of that czar data, so that went and opened those czar files and returned turn that back and then I'm going to pull out the values associated with those. And then finally, I've got my matplotlib down here. So this is fairly standard Jupyter matplotlib stuff. I'm going to draw a plot. I'm going to add the temperature data to it. I'm going to add the sea level pressure data to it. And then I'm going to go ahead and add some labels and show it. So let me hit enter. And there we go. Now we've got our weather for February 13th, 2021. And you can see it was pretty cold. In the US, there was a definite cold front that was coming in. And over here in Seattle, uh, we had our big snowstorm that day. I think it was the most snow since um, you know a person last walked on the moon or something like that. So it was a pretty big snow day. But let's say we want to look at this for a different day. Well, we can do that using notebook executions as well. There's a couple pieces of information we need. So I'm going to go back to my uh, studio workspace, just change my view here a little bit. I need the ID of the notebook and the cluster that it's connected to. So you can see I want this E4 PW notebook and this J20 cluster. So I would copy this information and I would create uh, an AWS CLI to go through and execute that. So let me switch over to my console here. Great. So here's my notebook execution. I'm going to specify the editor ID that we got from the workspace over there. I'm going to specify the relative path to that notebook, and then I want to specify the weather date. So let's try something uh, kind of random. Let's look at uh, September of 2019, and we'll just name that summer, and that's the cluster that we want to execute it on. So I'll go ahead, hit enter. What this is doing is this is submitting a command to the EMR API and saying, go ahead, execute that notebook that I have in my studio and replace the weather date parameter. And so what I can do is I can take this notebook execution ID and I can go ahead and see what is happening with that notebook. So we have a describe notebook execution command. When I run that, you can see that the notebook is starting and you can see the parameters that are getting passed into that notebook. And if I keep executing that, you'll be able to see that process of the notebook going through. So now it's running. And you can also see that there's an output notebook URI. So when that notebook runs, it puts the output back out to S3 in this executions folder in your workspace ID. So this should run pretty quickly. Um, I'm going to do an S3 LS of that output location and see if that file exists. And it looks like it does. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and copy that file locally. I'm going to say weather output.ipynb. And then I'll go back to my EMR studio. And what I'll do is I'll go back to my file browser all the way down to the root and I will upload that weather output file. That'll take just a couple seconds to upload. I can go ahead and open that. And what we should see is the output of the notebook. So this ran through the notebook um, for me. And you can see down here, it actually added that weather date parameter um, below that cell that has the parameter in it. So we essentially replaced that value uh, in the notebook run. And then we can also see if I scroll all the way down, now we've got the weather for September 1st. 2019. This is pretty cool, right? Because we can actually look and see um, what the temperatures were. And we can also see there was a pretty massive hurricane coming up off the coast of Florida. I believe that was Hurricane Dorian. So, um, you know, really easy to go ahead and parameterize these different notebooks and, and run them through with different values and pull the output out of them. I could, of course, have written this, uh, this map out to S3 as well. So pretty easy to do that. But that's a quick demo of how you can use EMR 
Studio. You can log into it uh, straight from AWS SSO without a console account. You can create a new EMR cluster or connect to an existing EMR cluster and just go ahead and run your, your analysis really quickly. So that's it for the demo. Uh, let me switch back to the presentation and we'll wrap up. All right, so that was how you can use EMR Studio on top of EMR to easily run some of your data analysis workloads. Pretty cool, right? So thank you. Um, thanks for coming today. Thanks for listening to this. I hope you see how much uh, benefit there is to moving to managed analytics. I wish this had existed when I had my own startup and I never really want to have to run my own HBase or Elasticsearch cluster again. So um, thank you again very much. A few closing notes. If you are doing analytics on AWS, there's a couple programs I want you to know about. There's the AWS Data Driven Everything program, where if you want to have a quick meeting with us to learn, you know, are you going the right direction with your analytics workload? Um, that's one thing that we offer where we can kind of help, help understand what you're trying to do and provide recommendations. If you want to go a little bit deeper, there's also the AWS Data Lab. This is a fantastic program. You can literally uh, send your engineers to Seattle, or we have locations, I believe, in New York and London now as well. So you can send your, your engineers to AWS to work with solution architects at AWS on building out your actual data lake. We will help you build that data lake side by side, hand by hand. And so this is a program that's really, really awesome. So if you have you know, an account manager you can talk to, reach out to them, inquire about this program. You can, of course, learn about data analytics with AWS training and certification. So definitely visit there, take a look at that. And then I just want to say thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today. I hope that you check out some of these services and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. One last thing, please complete the session survey. We take this in data very, very seriously. We'd love to hear your feedback. So um, definitely complete that session survey and let us know how we did. Thank you.